should be favored in the short term okay, by natural selection because they can produce more offspring, get more of a share of the resources, etc. I focused on more specifically in my work this, this really simple form of society, which I call communal egg layers. And you might see a bunch of different ways, and those of you who have been in my classes where I was trying to think of different ways when I talked about my work for my one lecture or whatever per seminar to uh, figure out another way to use this term, but cooperatively breeding animals, like cooperatively breeding birds would be another example of this. Communal egg layers is most relevant for the insects I've worked on because you basically have a few females that come together and lay eggs together, rear those offsprings together. But what we see are um, differences among these females in these simple social groups, such as these tree hoppers I studied for my PhD, or these lace bugs that I've also worked on with collaborators. Um, differences in the clutch sizes, in other words, how many offspring each female produces, and then also, these are the benefits of cooperation, and then the uh, costs of cooperation in terms of who gets stuck caring for the offspring. For example, in these tree hoppers that I worked on, I see a whole range uh, from coordinated uh, cooperative care of guarding the eggs together, and that's basically to attract the ants to the eggs to protect the uh, eggs. Uh, versus females many times will lay eggs and then leave without providing any care. And that's actually the uh, norm in this particular species of insects. So how can that be tolerated? Why would a host want to have extra offspring that she then has to rear? rear? It's like a form of root parasitism that she needs. So most of my early theoretical work uh, had to do with that particular question of root parasitism. But more recently, I've become interested in reproductive uh, conflict, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this is just a plug for my earlier work, uh, where trying to understand why in a mixed uh, uh, offspring society, this female here might tolerate an asymmetry where this female might be able to leave without providing any of the offspring care, and therefore, if she's either a Paris, increase her future reproductive success. So how is that resolved? When is that actually cooperative in terms of some sort of nepotism versus some sort of manipulation or cheating by the second female? What I'm going to talk to you about today is what happens uh, before that point. So what happens during the production of offspring? Why is it in so many societies, whether it be lions, mongooses, wasps, tree hoppers, we see uh, asymmetry in the number of offspring that are produced, the extreme being calves differentiation, saying ants or wasps or bees, where females forego reproduction entirely. In a lot of cases, such as in paper wasps, for example, where it's not completely separated in division of labor, one female, say a subordinate, will produce just a few offspring, air and blue, and the other female will produce a large majority of the offspring. And it begs the question of why this female would participate in this sort of inequality system. And of course, you'll probably think immediately, well, that depends on what she gets out of it relative to what her alternative options are. And that has a lot to do with what we call in this world of uh, theory, her outside options. Her options to nest solitarily, her options to potentially join another female that may be more cooperative. And those are the types of, it's a very simple economic, it's really bargaining theory. And those are the types of models I work on. We're trying to understand when these societies are stable, given that there's often um, asymmetries in the currency of natural selection, which is offspring production. So these are just a few of the papers that I've worked on um, with that question. And this is a paper I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of my theory on reproductive conflict, this model I published a couple years ago now, because I've been extending that model with some collaborators in, I think, some very exciting ways that I want to introduce you to. And I'm going to talk about this cool system I've started with graduate students here at State, which has been um, really fruitful in certain ways, in other ways very frustrating, um, as usual, when you start a new system. And I'll talk about some of the neat things we've found so far. And then I'll talk about future directions and uh, the work that's starting already in my lab with two graduate students on communal uh, nesting and salamanders. So in all of these cases, we're interested in these communal nesters. And the range uh, goes from more uh, potentially cooperative to highly conflict, <laughs> which we'll talk about. 
So again, we're talking about <coughs> asymmetry of reproduction, how that might be evolutionarily stable. And these, this question falls under a whole body of theory called reproductive skew theory. And um, that sounds, may sound a little bit jargony, uh, but that's the, what these models have been labeled. And that's because, you, as you can see, the reproduction is skewed toward this female. So skew theory uh, back in the uh, 90s and then certainly last uh, in the, in the um, last 10 years or so uh, has become a really popular uh, avenue of research among um, many different labs. Many PhD theses have been done on this question. But one frustrating thing, and behavior ecology sort of suffers from these cyclic uh, uh, moments of excitement, bandwagon, and then burnout. And this is definitely um, an area of research that has suffered from that uh, <coughs> cycle. And the reason it has is because there have been a unusually uh, high number of models that have been published. I think there's been at least 30 different models. Um, and it became um, really a runaway selection process. <laughs> and it became really uh, hard for even the theoreticians to keep up on what everyone was publishing. Um, on this important question, but one might ask, was it really that important? Um, what, I, what we found uh, a few years ago, uh, my close friend and collaborator Pete Buston at Boston University, who's now at Boston University and I, was that we needed to sort of sit down and see whether it was even worth doing another skew theory model because um, it just was seeming like either everything had been done or it, it, there might be some way to recover some sensibility and usefulness for the empiricists who are feeling pretty overwhelmed uh, in general. And what we, we sort of tried to go back to first principles and ask, well, what are these models really useful for? And uh, what are the basic essentials? And try to come up with kind of a manifesto of, of sort of a new way of doing skew theory. Um, and some of the things we talked about in our paper were super surprising to people because they've been talked around about in some of the circles. But we just tried to lay them out real systematically. One is just to really be explicit about this simple um, observation that all of the models were really split into two different types. And you, you remember this picture I showed up here of these two different females. And say these are two paper wasps. Um, one is usually a dominant, one is usually a subordinate. But we have all sorts of approximate ways in which we define a dominant and a subordinate in terms of aggression, say. And certainly a dominant doesn't always have complete control. It's not omniscient. It doesn't always know that the subordinate's laying eggs. It doesn't, it's not always successful in kicking the subordinate out of the subordinate, say, is taking too much resources. However, all these models had assumed one or the other extreme of who controls reproduction and who controls group membership with an entire class of models, mostly coming out of Cornell, assuming that the dominant female controlled everything, including whether this female stays and, and how many offspring she gets to produce. And then a whole other group of models that were kind of like the sort of antagonistic <laughs> uh, models that, in terms of uh, a reaction to the Cornell models coming out of Cambridge from a few theoreticians there, such as Rufus Johnstone and uh, Clutton, Tim Clutton Brock, that were mostly modeled based on uh, vertebrates and in particular mammals, suggesting that well, mostly in mammals there's um, obviously some cryptic reproduction, et cetera, and just it doesn't quite fit the natural history. So they suggested that this female could control group membership but had no control over reproduction at all. And in that case, this female could simply steal as much reproduction as she wanted from the group or the resources until she got kicked out. Now, that's a, a really digressing here. But what the result is, is that really important predictions, such as the relationship between this um, skew and things like kinship or ecological constraints, like nesting sites, all the predictions were 180 degrees opposite. So you can see how that would make empiricists really frustrated. So we talked about how that's uh, frustrating, and there's a need for a model that synthesizes both of those extremes. Okay, and those are these two. Um, assumptions of skew theory models. The third is that there have, all the models were then split again between models that were based on how the group resolves conflicts. So remember I was talking about these being bargaining type models. 
And I was talking about a type of model where this female decides to stay or leave based on her bargaining power, what she could get if she left. And therefore, you might imagine this female then conceding some sort of amount of minimum amount of reproduction if she's in control to entice this female to remain versus uh, having this female leave to pursue better options. So this is basically you know, bargaining over anything, salary, et cetera. This is a transactional model, okay? Um, and, uh, and basically, um, the other types of models have uh, costly competition, where females fight for reproduction with them. So that's basically the overarching motivation for this um, model. <clears throat> the limitations are many-fold. They, they made these models limited and less general. So we came up with a very uh, simple synthetic model um, with very stripped down uh, parameters. One is the groups expect reproductive output if they do breed together. S is simply individuals expect reproduction if she stays and doesn't leave the group. If she leaves, she gets reproduction L in terms of the number of offspring that survives to maturity. And what we allow females to do then, besides not being explicit about who's dominant subordinate here, which is our first contribution, is we allow females to both negotiate on um, what they can get from outside, their outside options, and then also their inside options in terms of the threat of cost of competition um, uh, increasing their share that, that they may receive. And then all of these models are based on um, a genetic model uh, uh, produced by a group of, originally produced by Bill Hamilton called Kent Selection, which many of you are familiar with. And that just uh, bifurcates an individual's uh, fitness into their direct fitness in terms of their own offspring. And whether any allele would evolve or say cooperation, it has to take into account the presence of that allele in another individual that's receiving benefits at some probability R of being present, the exact same copy of that allele. So in full sibling, that would be 0.5. Okay. So this is just an equation that since I'm sort of you know, a little verbose today, I'm not going to go through because I'm running a little behind. But, but just so you know, what this does is it sets up a situation where we can have a female negotiate based on here her outside options like we talked about. The second female's ability to leave for a better situation, imposing a bargain on the, dom the resident female you know, who may or may not be a dominant. And then she's able to negotiate some fraction P of the reproduction here. Okay? We also allow that same female to potentially compete for shares within the nest. And this was a novel contribution, so she can simultaneously um, bargain and compete with the threat of reducing group productivity to G minus here, okay? Or being given some fraction of reproduction Q, which is sort of the essence or a, a piece incentive. So we combine these two together, and that was really what the um, main contribution of this model was. And by doing so, we, we synthesize these two different classes of models based on competition and outside transactions um, for, but without making assumptions about who's in control. And the result was interesting. We, we found often that there was very little zone of conflict, but the way in which you can um, understand this graph here is that when you isolate a particular parameter, like the group's reproduction, how many offspring the group have together, there's this zone here of stability. And we're not solving for any particular area of this zone in terms of how they divide up the kids. That is necessarily the optimum. And okay, that's going to depend on their mechanisms of how they can um, uh, basically sneak reproduction for their own benefit. But this is the minimum amount of reproduction that, say, an individual needs based on her outside options. This is the maximum that she would allow um, uh, uh, a female to, to uh, take, uh, her partner to take. Okay? And what this is, is this is the, the minimum that her partner, who say is the superior competitor, individual B, can threaten to take based on the costly competition G minus. And without going on into any details, what we did was we were able to solve for these zones of competition where females would actually fight over reproductive shares and we would have conflict versus cooperation. Groups would not form here. These are zones of conflict. 
And these are zones of both um, stability and tranquility, we call it. And this is relevant because um, in so many animal societies, we know that animals are highly combative, but we rarely see outright aggression. There are these subtle threats that have been modeled. Um, because as you might imagine, information is a lot less uh, costly to receive than downright violence, right? So there's often all these negoti subtle negotiation mechanisms that occur. So I'm taking this model right now and extending it in three different ways. And I want to talk to you about one way in which I'm extending it. I'm working on a model of group parasitism right now as an outside option with Bruce Lyon who used to Santa Cruz. I'm working on a model of um, division of labor with Pete Buston. Both of these papers are basically finished. And then I'm uh, still finishing this paper that I want to talk to you about right now about extending this model <coughs> to parent offspring conflict. So are there any questions so far about the model? Because I'm just going to extend it one step further. And, okay, and point out that in all these societies, just like in our own families, we have conflict among siblings and even tension between parents and offspring because from a genetic perspective, Parents are, e are equally invested in all their offspring, assuming they're the parent, okay? And from the offspring's perspective, there's a genetic asymmetry between themselves and the sibling. You might have a different father, and you might only inherit 50% of their alleles due to um, mitosis, right? So from the genetic perspective, there's this particularly inherent asymmetry that has been um, modeled and studied quite a bit. One area in which this has become very important uh, influential, but lately kind of a red herring, so to speak, in terms of the evolution of past differentiation <coughs> in um, insects, is among the hymenoptera. So this is the order of ants, wasps, and bees, whereas you know many of the species have a daughters that forego reproduction entirely to become workers that help raise their brothers and sisters to become future reproductors. Okay? So this is a uh, phylogeny from a science paper that came out recently which tested a, um, a long-standing theory, which has been articulated more recently by Kuz Boomsma, um, suggesting that the mating system of these hymenoptera is going to affect the um, ability or the argument for uh, um, kin selection being an explanation for caste differentiation. Okay, so the traditional argument was, because of this strange genetic twist, where daughters are diploid and sons are haploid, okay, worker females end up being related to future queens by 0.75, 75% of the probability of shared alleles. Of course, daughters are 50%, just like our, um, our own species. Sons here, even though they're haploid, are also 50% from the perspective of um, this worker. Of course, since she's not mating, if she's stuck in a nest, she can only raise sons. But what I want to point out, and I'll go back to the phylogeny, is it, it's generally applicable to diploid species such as termites or naked mole rats, because as long as there's a marginal fecundity advantage that your mom has over yourself, okay, it's marginally equal in terms of genetic relatedness to your daughter and to your full sister. Okay? So this is a general, and the reason I point this out is because there's been a big controversy recently suggesting that this particular uh, twist is sort of the downfall of kin solution. And uh, there was this major paper that got a lot of attention. But it was really a red herring argument because we all know that this is a more generalizable result, okay? But that really, this has a lot specifically simply to do with the hymenoptera. But it doesn't mean that kin selection is not a general explanation of health behavior and social evolution. What this graph shows is repeated evolution of polyandry, where um, queens will mate with multiple males. So what you see here in the blue, as it says here, is that the ancestral condition in the entire order of Hymenoptera, so here are species wasps, here are solitary bees, apis is somewhere in here. Apis is right here. Apis and honeybees are actually polyandrous. And there's all sorts of reasons they might want to mate with multiple males, including the genetic benefits for the colony. But the point, <coughs> of, this, the point of this phylogeny is, among the ants, say here as well, 
all of the um, lineages that are polyandrous, where queens mate with multiple males, are all more derived. And the argument they're trying to make, at least in this biology, and, and it'd be interesting to talk to others about what they think about this, is that mo monogamy is the ancestral state. And the reason that monogamy would have to be the ancestral state for kin selection to be the explanation for the evolution of these sociology or sterile cats is because um, if this sister has a different father than her sister, then all of a sudden that relatedness is going to be cut in half. It's going to go down to 0.25 in both cases. It's going to go down to 0.25. In this case, it'll go down by a third, by two thirds. And that then makes Hamilton's inequality for the evolution of females giving up reproduction on time. Okay? So that's the argument. So because uh, this seems like such an important um, hypothesis, I decided to, to investigate how this might actually affect um, reproductive skew in hymenopteran societies that have multiple queens. It's called polygyny. Okay? This is a many ants, for example, have more than one queen, so two queens. When you have two queens, it starts to get very complicated, okay? Because you've got workers now that are coming from both queens, okay? Well, that's not a huge deal if you consider their self-interest from the perspective of the portion of the nest that has their own brood with their own siblings. It all works out like as if it was their own nest. But once it starts getting mixed up, it becomes a little complicated in terms of this solution for reproductive skew that I was talking about. And no one has thought of this before. But as I said um, earlier, uh, queens are related to their daughters by 50%. Um, they're related to the daughters of the other queen by 50% devalued by the kinship between those queens. <coughs> What's interesting here is that we've got the 0.75 with uh, these full cysts. This is under monogamy, okay? But we've got um, 0.25, since they have different fathers, devalued by relatedness, okay, with the uh, future reproductive uh, females of the other queen. Now what you'll notice here is when you divide the relatedness, the relative relatedness between this current worker with a future queen that's not her full sister, relative to her full sister, you get R times one third, okay? Look at the queen here. From the queen's perspective, it's simply R. So the bottom line here is that under monogamy, uh, uh, workers are one third as related to future queens of the other queen as their mom is. Okay, and what's the implication for that? Okay, one little caveat which I won't go into, but it has major implications for the evolution of sex ratios in ants, is that the conflict goes away completely when it's uh, males and it's drones, which is interesting. What's the bottom line? It, what this means is that the mother's minimum requirement. Remember, I was talking about what that second female would tolerate to be part of the society. So this is what would the second queen tolerate in terms of the other queen's reproduction. Well, let's say based on reproductive skew theory, the model that I published with Weston, this is the uh, mom's minimum what she would allow. So she'll she'll allow that other queen to push her down the gear before aggression starts to happen. She attempts to eject her. Well, under monogamy, the workers are going to want the mom to only can only give up this much. Okay, so here's a zone of actual conflict between the workers and their moms, the other, their mom and queen, over how much that queen concedes in terms of reproduction. Does that make sense to people? And that actually completely disappears under polyandry. So that's a really interesting possible. Um, and so right now I'm mapping um, monogamy and polyandry here onto polygyny, so the ants that have one or two queens, trying to understand whether part of this evolutionary process might be related to conflict over reproductive skew. But we could take just two isolated cases. One is fire ants, where I've got a lot of attention for queen killing. And it's, the story there is that the second queen has this GP9 locus, that's a green beard allele. So if some of you may have heard about that, you can take my course if you don't think. Um, this is an allele that actually can recognize itself. So it can increase related genetic relatedness to 100%. And workers actually kill 
possible uh, rejoining second queens okay, that are incompatible. Well, this is an alternative explanation for this because Solenopsis invicta is monogamous. So there's uh, likely to be extreme uh, conflict between, even though the queen here is not aggressive at all toward this invading queen, the workers, her daughters, are highly aggressive when they kill her. Leptothorax is a wood-dwelling ant in um, Britain that's been studied quite a bit. Just in the last two years, it's been shown that the workers actually, another monogamous species, the workers uh, actually uh, uh, physically harass the other queen and suppress her reproduction, whereas the, their mom does very little. Okay? So there's more and more examples of worker control over reproduction um, when we have this overlap of generations. And so this is something I'm pretty excited about. I have to talk to you at length about that, but right now I'm going to agree that Sai relieves relief because I'm not talking about models anymore. I'm going to talk to you really quickly about the earwaves we've been working on. So, um, we've been working on this earwig since I arrived out here. I realized there's a lot fewer insects than I was used to out east, and I couldn't find any tree hoppers to work on as much as I tried, and tried to find this oak tree hopper to much my chagrin, and it was not abundant as I thought it would be. I needed to find a, some sort of communally nesting organism. And if, I, mean, I know that, knew that all Dermaptera, so uh, the 2,000 species have been described, of the dozen that have been studied, they all have extended maternal care. Good start. The European area, which we're all familiar with from our houses or apartments or gardens, um, has uh, also communal nesting. Great. Unfortunately, a, a lead evolutionary biologist, Matthias Kolliker, University of Basel has been already studying maternal care and communal nesting and all sorts of <coughs> conflict questions in the species. So it was off limits. I didn't, you know, he was way ahead of me. So um, I chose this huge, gigantic earwig that's common on the shores. It's also invasive species. It's been around since at least the early 1900s. It's common on the shores around the San Francisco Bay. Uh, it's not omnivorous like this species. It's totally pre predatory. It eats these terrestrial amphipods on the shores, and it only lives just on the high tide mark. So it nests just above the high, high tide as well, under rocks and driftwood. So you can completely find this thing around here, or come to my lab. And um, as in all other earwigs, the male um, forceps, which are their weapons, are curved instead of straight. Okay, so this is the male, and this is the female. Okay. So we've been doing some research um, out at the Audubon Tiburon Center, and this is Julie Miller, who was a master's student of mine, and this is Lena Rudolph, who's an undergraduate who worked with her. And since I'm running a little behind, I know some of you have seen her work, so I may kind of skip over it a little, because I'm, I'm running about 10 minutes behind today. But, um, what I'll tell you is she did some really cool work trying to figure out the function of maternal care. Very quickly, we found that while moms will, they form these little nests on the beach, while moms will tend the eggs by cleaning the microbes off of them, and um, she also found that they spend a lot of their time fighting off other females because females try to invade their nests and eat their eggs. So this is, makes a very interesting game that occurs out in this uh, intertidal region where females are basically eating each other's offspring during the nest season. <coughs> Now there's no cooperation here. This is totally conflict. But here are a few nests. And it's hard to find nests, but we can definitely find them. Um, here's a few, here just give you an idea how close together they can be. Here's one, here's another one. Um, so they're highly gregarious. It's likely that they nest close together because uh, they're highly gregarious in the non-breeding season, not aggressive at all. Once they start laying eggs, they're highly aggressive and highly solitary. solitary. And the males um, are also expelled. Um, they probably nest close together simply due to site and nest site location. They're very high densities of the sites where they work. So what Julie found in her master's thesis here um, at San Francisco State was that um, there is a real adaptive function to having one of them. When she removed moms from these egg masses, she found that the hatching success plummeted, both in the field, from field nests, we had about 50 field nests, and in the lab. And it appears to um, be uh, because moms are constantly cleaning the eggs, and if you remove the mom, uh, fungus and bacteria grow like wild on these eggs and the eggs die. Um, here's a mom with her nest. 
She only stays with them for about seven days before they disperse. Um, there's an advantage we found in the lab to abandoning, so there seems to be a cost to maternal care, and that if we liberate females by allowing them to uh, leave the eggs, we pull them away and allow them to uh, start a new clutch and feed them, they actually start a clutch, they have a, a lower internest interval. So there might be some trade-off. And of course, this is in the lab. We have not been able to mark and capture females in the field. That's the major disappointment of the system, and we're still working on it. But in the lab, we've been able to at least get approximate one measure of fitness costs in maternal care and that it takes them longer to recover and uh, yoke up new eggs and lay them nest if they provided care for the three week period. She also found, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, as we suspected, that when you have a second female in the arena, that um, the presence of the mom around the eggs increases hatching success independent of um, the mom's presence, uh, how can I put it? Moms with, here, put it this way. If you have moms and you have a, a conspecific, but then you also have the conspecific, a second female, and you remove the mom, there's a much higher fraction of eggs that are cannibalized. So in other words, mom's presence is important not only for cleaning the eggs, but for repelling cannibals. And um, this translates to the higher hatch of success when moms are out, when there's conspecifics that can eat for eggs. You'll see egg uh, predation is fairly high here. That's because moms eat their own eggs too. This is a cool result, but it makes the system very complicated. Um, and this is a challenge now in thinking of future experiments. I do have a master's student that finished who <coughs> had invaders that were dead, basically simulated invasion with uh, dry new eggs, and looked to see how, so then of course the invaders did the eggs. And then look to see how that invasion stress uh, affected um, females' uh, propensity to eat their own offspring. There wasn't that. So we're still trying to figure out elegant ways to tease that apart. Um, the other potential future direction is something Julie found, which is that when females um, are larger, when they're the uh, resident female, they always seem to win and become a smaller female. When, when residents are smaller, they seem to only win half the so there seems to be a real resonant advantage. Not surprisingly, you would fight harder if your babies are about to get eaten. Um, but I think this system is actually ideal for some of these traditional hawk-dove games and animal behavior and resource, um, quality of resource and uh, assessment, et cetera. So that's another potential direction. In general, when the resident was larger, she had a higher hatching success. So this is after controlling for effects of body size on so this is really has to do with the relative size of the invader. So um, I have a few more minutes. So one fun thing we've done on the side, which Eleanor is involved in too now, um, and, and Rachel, another undergraduate, is um, looking at the function of these asymmetric weapons. So the males use these to get food, but they also fight with one another on the beaches. And um, unlike many other uh, animals, um, particularly earwigs, that are highly symmetric uh, weapons, um, in this particular case, the right forcep is often curved in. Okay? Females are totally symmetric. This is one of the most asymmetric that, that they'll ever get right here. They're using those correctly. Um, and another graduate student, Nicole Munoz, um, Without showing you the data, I can tell you the story really quickly. She basically found, uh, this is Chris Kwok's uh, drawing, He's a very amazing artist, for those of you who know Chris, that um, they always turn to the uh, right side, such as the dorsal, um, the more hooked forceps on the dorsal side in between the abdominal plates. And that seems to give them better purchase um, for throwing the male um, or, um, or pinning the male to the ground. So she had all these fights that she did among the animals, and she standardized the winner loser effects and hunger levels and all these other potential confounding variables. And basically found that bigger males beat smaller males. But when males were smaller, so below the mean population size, the males that um, were more asymmetric were able to dominate the more symmetric males. And it was a pretty striking result. Um, and we're still unsure exactly what's going on there in terms of the adaptive significance of that. But it was a pretty cool result. And um, one thing we're looking into now are 
this other curious aspect of their morphology, which is that many airways have two penises. But these are penises. This is the penis lobe here, right and left. This family of airways, subfamily, um, is the uh, only one that uses both. Okay? A lot of families only use one and left. I think European only uses the left. Well, we've already been finding uh, that uh, they, they do use both. And so we're going back through a bunch of specimens that we've used for another graduate student's master's thesis on mating systems. She didn't get a lot of matings, but she had a lot of courtship behavior. And we're going back to try and see if there's a correlation between not only mating success, but also this asymmetry in which penis they use. And they seem to only use one or the other. So which one they have. Right now, what this uh, SEM has done is uh, extended both. But when we dissect them, this is basically back and not retracted, or this one's back. It seems to be about 60, 40 right now percent. So we're just working on that in the last few weeks. And I was working on that project along with Rachel. And we're trying to go through these specimens and see if there's a pattern, which is it's interesting. So I have three minutes to talk about my future directions. Um, so ever since even I was looking for postdocs, I've always been really interested in this particular question. And this question is the interaction between community ecology and social evolution. And it's really simple, I think. You don't even necessarily have to invoke kin selection, although if these two individuals are related genetically, it helps facilitate the process, but they don't have to be. The simple idea is that Animals that interact with the mutualistic species, let's say the tree hoppers I studied and their mutualistic ants. The mutualism with the ants returns positive benefits to other group members, which can then uh, increase and facilitate the social bonds among those individuals. Okay? Conversely, as we know with mating systems, we've done a lot of work that um, sexually transmitted disease can disrupt mating systems and we uh, affect how mating systems evolve. You might imagine, of course, spreading parasites through social interactions is going to disrupt the evolution of sociology. So I've always been interested in this question. And Vance and I have always been trying to find a way to work together. So we've mm -hmm. finally found a communally nesting animal that seems to have a parasite that may have some effect on their behavior to be determined. Mm -hmm. um, you've all probably heard of BD, uh, this parasitic kitchen fungus that affects the skins of amphibians. We know from an uh, undergraduate at Berkeley uh, who published a paper a few years ago that uh, the trachycephs attenuatus, which is the local slender salamander, has this um, fungus. And Carla um, Setti in my lab has found that that's now widespread. Um, and it goes back at least into the uh, 70s uh, in Northern California. We also know from work of Dave Wake, um, who's the expert on this genus in Berkeley, and his student Elizabeth Jakush, who's now in Connecticut, that at least some of the species are highly gregarious. This is a picture of the uh, trachycephs gregarious from the Southern Sierras. It's a black and white picture from her paper. But here are all these eggs, and here are the adults. And so um, some of the nests they've found have been up to 200 eggs. The female clutch sizes range from like 8 to 11 eggs. So these are highly uh, communal nests. Some species like Attenuatus, it's still unclear where the eggs actually are. But what we're interested in is real straightforward. We're trying to take advantage of the fact that Wake and Jakush have basically done the um, phylogeography of this entire genus. Okay, so these are different species. These are the ones that I've picked out of the 23 that have been described that are highly represented in museum specimens. So here's 22,000 museum specimens for Tendulatus. Okay, all these different other species. Why are there so many museum specimens? This is one of the most common vertebrates in California. Okay, you've heard of tree all the salamander. So what we're doing right now um, is uh, using these techniques that Vance and his lab have uh, developed um, with their collaborators to um, use qPCR to look at the history of BD in some of these different um, populations and species. So far, we've only done some counties uh, around uh, Northern California for this one species of Tendulatus. <coughs> Here's a paper even showing the genetic differentiation among different subpopulations of the Tendulatus. Angel Island is highly genetically, has a high genetic distance from 
Southern Marin. I mean, they're that, and it's not just because they're separated by water, but part of it is because they don't move very far in the sound energy. So there's a lot of potential for microevolution and geographic variation. And I'm going over one minute, I'm going to go one more minute to plug Carla's work, which is already showing. She randomly sampled 20 individuals from each decade going back to the 40s in 12 different counties in Attenuatus and found that BD has shown up in about the 70s and it's spread in certain <laughs> counties. This is uh, Zosport, I suppose it's Zisua or Zosport count. And this is um, some counties such as Santa Cruz or Santa Clara. We have a high level of infection. And these are the proportion of individuals that are infected in each of these different spots in different decades. So what we want to do is um, a few different things. The first is characterize just simply the degree of chemoanesthesia in some of these populations and species. No one's done this really before. The second is to test for a negative relationship between the history of BD in these populations based on museum specimens, so we have so many of them, and um, current behavior in terms of chemoanesthesia. We also want to test and verify that at an ecological time, communal nesting does spread the pathogen. Okay? And we have different hypotheses for the relationship between um, history of fungal infection and current behavior based on what the disease dynamics might be and what the probability of transfer is, is based on their communal nesting behavior. So we're just starting from scratch here, but we're pretty excited about the potentials. Finally, we're going to try and look for other microbes in that past the communal nesting. Five steps so um, anyway, that's a flavor of where I'm going in the future. These are some thank yous, and uh, I have time for questions. Covered a lot of ground. Questions? I was wondering that biologically, where you have the monogamous ones and the polyandrous ones, and all those. Yeah. Is it possible that the ancestral one just made it once? Is that something that's likely? Or, I just was wondering about how often do these insects make Um. Well, many of them may, I mean, like uh, Avis will make, she'll make with up to 10 males or more. So it's not, it's a really good question in the sense of, well, are you talking about? The ancestral ones, they probably made it once and that's what it Correct. Yeah. Yeah, well, this, this is a reconstructed phylogeny, so uh, it's a hypothesis. But all these groups here that are in blue are all uh, monogamous. Groups. There's, monogamy is certainly the uh, majority of folks in our. But, but I, think, yeah. I think, if I understand yeah. Ravinder's question, it's how many instances, if, if mating events happen, not just how many, how many males, right? Is that. Yeah. Yeah. In terms not, of how many times do they mate with the same male? There's no reason I say eight at all. Oh, most of my monoptera, I'm sorry, most of my monoptera made during a very narrow window of time. Yeah, when they store sperm throughout up to 20 years or more, 30 years. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and so um, in a very short window of time, they walk their big nuptial flight, their wing, then they mate, and then they lose their wings. Start <coughs> and then they store that sperm, and they're not mating with the wings. Where do the, the males in terms of the females and the males? Oh, that's a great question. Do they ever come from the same nest? Are they ever brothers? What are the three coefficients? I don't know, and that, that's a really interesting question, which, you know, based on the ecology and the population structure, how close the nests are, you would affect, you would expect <laughs> that to really affect this due to inbreed movements. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't know any really good review that's looked at the evolution of these sociology based on inbreed movements based on nest dispersion. And also, I mean, the effects of these relationships are dependent on the inbreed movement background, the inbreed movement population. I mean, that's what stars are. Right. Right, so they're all, yeah, so they're all based on, I mean, I don't know whether like, these quellers, regression level relatedness, but they, it's all based on the degree to which an individual has the opportunity to target another individual that's more related to them than the background. Absolutely. So if it's a highly inbred, um, like Taylor's done a great model, here Taylor's done a great model show, it's a highly inbred population, that uh, kind of selection has zero impact. Right. 
there's, yeah, <laughs> so there's no option. Yeah. Um, so that's another angle. In addition to the uh, sort of dispersion of this, another angle would be to, to try and put inbreeding coefficients on here and then look at how, you know, for example, whether that would be <coughs> implications for how weak can selection would be in those areas of phylogeny created link, weak links that allow for the evolution of the polygon. That would be a great hypothesis. Thank you. 